All right, so this is our equipment for the making salts practical. You will notice the same equipment that is at the bottom of the first page of your sheet. We've got a couple of measuring cylinders, one made of glass, one made of plastic. You could use either, you only need one. Um, we've also got a glass rod made of glass, a spatula made of metal, and a beaker as well. And you can hear me being gentle with those because you can hear the little tinkling of the noise of glass on glass on metal on glass as well. Moving over to the right, we have got a funnel and a conical flask. The shape of this flask makes it a conical flask, like a cone you could think about. Um, we have also got tripods, Bunsen burner, and a heat proof mat. Now unfortunately, I can't use these at the moment because the gas has all been turned off, so I'm going to use a, something a little bit different that I'll introduce in a moment, um, but uh, for the standard experiment, for the heating you'd be using your Bunsen burner, uh, with the heat proof mat, and a tripod. Try for three, three different legs. Uh, what else have we got over here? Um, we have got our evaporating basin for evaporation and a crystallizing dish as well. A crystallizing, okay. crystallizing dish made of glass and the evaporating basin made of ceramic. What else have we got over here? We've got some boiling tubes. Distinct from test tubes because they can stand, uh, withstand the increase of heat that would come from um, heating them up. So uh, a little bit thicker than a test tube because they're used in experiments when we're using heating. And you can see that I'm keeping them in a tube holder because otherwise they'd be rolling about everywhere. Uh, we've also got some sulfuric acid and copper oxide, this black powder in here. We've got what are called mass boats and that's where you pour a solid into in order to measure it, to weigh it, to find its mass. Bigger one and smaller one and then we've got some filter paper as well for when we end up filtering. Okay. So what am I going to be using instead of a Bunsen burner? Well, I'll be using a hot plate, which allows me to heat something up without using a flame. So because the gas is turned off, I'm going to, in, in its place, use this hot plate, which is not dissimilar from what you might use at home, like the, um, the gas hob or the electric range cooker. So you had a little think about the risks that come with using glassware and an open flame. But what I want to talk about now is something that is a little bit more specific to this particular experiment. When you're asked to look at the risks of an experiment, you will always look at things like the glassware and the uh, exposed flames and um, the way you set up an experiment to make sure that um, spillages and knockages and things like that are less likely to happen. But you will also need to uh, have the ability to speak a little bit more specifically about the chemicals that you're using. So here we're using copper oxide and sulfuric acid. And I've picked out a couple of things called has cards, has meaning hazards. Um, and there's a collection of has cards which tell you um, what sort of things you need to look out for, the possible dangers that could come, the risks, um, with using uh, some of these uh, chemicals. So for instance, here is our has card for uh, copper metal, copper carbonate, copper sulfide and oxides. Well, we're using a copper oxide, aren't we? So that's covered just here, copper oxide, copper one, and copper two oxides, both types of copper oxide. And 
what you can do is you can have a little look at what these uh, symbols tell you about um, its dangers. And so we've got a few dangers here. We've got our exclamation point. We've got a sign that shows something from a test tube being poured onto a surface and also onto somebody's hand. And presumably, presumably there's a danger involved there. And then we've got a hazard symbol showing a tree and a dead fish here. I wonder if you know or can remember which hazards those refer to. And so we've got the answer to that in written form. We have got that the copper oxide is harmful if swallowed. That's our point just here, our exclamation point. That it causes skin irritation. And that's in reference to this symbol here, which demonstrates that the chemical can be corrosive. You can see that it's attacking the, that could be the bench or the, the surface, and also that it's attacking living tissue. It's destroying living tissue. Um, we, if it was a very, something very strong, we'd say it was corrosive. Um, if it was something that was a little less severe, like this here, we might just say that it causes skin irritation. So you won't be shouting your head off, but you might well uh, be in a little bit of discomfort. Harmful if inhaled also, that is um, covered by a little exclamation point. And finally, very toxic to aquatic life with long lasting effects. And of course, that's what this stud symbol is trying to show here. You've got a dying tree with no leaves and an upside down fish, demonstrating that the chemical is dangerous to, um, to the environment. And so it's really important that as a school and as a science faculty that we um, dispose of these chemicals in the correct way, we can't just pour them down the sink because it's harmful to um, the environment. And you'll see here, finally, um, that some of these oxides can cause serious eye irritation. So, like in any experiment in school, we'll be wearing glasses as well. Now, when we're looking at sulfuric acid, uh, like the copper oxide, this also has its own has card. Um, the information here on the side of the bottle shows us that this chemical could be harmful if inhaled or swallowed and that it's sulfuric acid but it also tell us, tells us that this particular sulfuric acid its concentration is one molar. So what's great about the cards as well is that they give you specific information on the chemical but also um, extra information depending on how concentrated it is. So if we look over here, we've got a list of how concentrated the solution might be. We've got a um, very weak concentration at the bottom here, and you'll see that as a result, the information is that um, copper sulfate at a very weak um, concentration, less than 0 0.02 molar, would be not classified as being hazardous. But in this experiment, I'm using a solution of one molar. So, including an above one molar so, uh, copper sulfate, sorry, sulfuric acid, um, we would be looking at these possible dangers, uh, similar to the ones that we saw for the copper oxide. So again, it would be harmful if it was ingested, so whether that's swallowing or... Um, uh, breathing in and then it would also be corrosive as we see here and an irritant as well so see this time we're actually getting the word corrosive remember before for the copper oxide it was merely classified as an irritant to the skin but in this case something that would be corrosive um, is demonstrating that it would cause a lot more damage and start to attack the living tissue in a um, irreversible way 
And so very, very dangerous to get into your eyes. And so of course we would wear eye protection as well. So the first thing that I need to do is need to measure out my acid, measuring it in my cylinder and then passing it over into a boiling tube. So I'd like 10 centimetres cubed. I'm going to do that just now. I'm going to hold it up to eye level so that I can see exactly how much I'm pouring in. And I can stop exactly on 10. If it was down on the bench and I looked down and tried to see where 10 was, my perspective would give me a false impression of exactly where 10 was. And so I don't really want to be bending down like this for the whole time. So you saw me lift it up to eye level for exactly that reason. Taking my test tube out of the test tube rack and popping the acid into the test tube. Boiling tube, pardon me. And so what I need to do now is I want to heat this up. I want to heat the acid up because the reaction between the copper oxide and the acid is going to be a lot quicker if I do it at a higher temperature. Fortunately, I've got here a water bath. So that was the one of the things on our um, equipment list. A water bath is this electronic um, setup here. It looks just a bit like a tray, but as you can see, there's actually um, a figure readout there. It says 49 degrees Celsius. So I've set this um, contraption to be heating to 49 degrees Celsius. And if I lift this up, you can see what it's heating up. You can maybe see the condensation on the back of the uh, lid. It's heating up some water here. So I'm just going to pop in our acid there, and it's going to heat the acid up to 49 degrees. There's water under here and it's been heated up by some heating elements that are controlled uh, from this panel and that leads back to the um, mains electricity. Um, in true Blue Peter style, uh, here's one I did earlier. This is my um, acid that has already been heated to 49 degrees so that I can continue on with um, the experiment quickly now. Alright, so our acid is just coming up to the temperature that we need it to, coming up to 50 degrees so that the reaction between the acid and the copper oxide will be a quick one. Um, so just while that's happening I think I'm going to make a couple of measurements. So there's a few things that I want to find the mass of and so what I'm going to use, I'm going to use something called a mass boat and it's just something we use to pour um, chem solid chemicals into in order that we can get their masses. Copper oxide is, I'm going to take the mass of my mass boat, it is 1.1 grams, 1.1 grams, excellent. So now I've got to find out <clears throat> if I add in the mass, if I add in my copper oxide, what is my mass of copper oxide? So I can use my spatula, so here we go. Too much there. Okay, so we've got a combined mass of 2.6 grams when we've got the mass boat and the copper oxide as well. So 2.6 grams. So that means that we can work out. How much, how, what the mass of just copper oxide on its own is. So, for the mass boat at 1.1, when we added the copper oxide, we got a total of 2.6. So, if we want to find how much copper oxide I've added, well, we've got to do the 2.6, take away the 1.1, and that will give me 1.5 grams of copper oxide. That is what I have added to my 
mass or okay so what I'm going to do now I've got my copper oxide in my mass boat and I've also got my warm acid as well so I'm going to take my warm acid out of the water bath I'm going to add some of my copper oxide I'm going to start stirring it in order to make the reaction happen here we are my Warm acid, yep, definitely nice and warm. And I'm going to start adding some of this, some of this copper oxide just now. I'm going to add half of it first, and I'm going to give it a little stir. So, I see at the moment. Fairly black from the black solid copper oxide in the second half as well. So I've had my nice reaction. I've got a solution here where I've got a change in colour, because originally it was colourless. No, it's not, obviously. I wonder if you can see right at the edge there what the colour is. It looks black, but in fact, I can see a slightly different colour. I can see a little bit of blue there. Just very dark blue, if you look at the top of the ellipsis there. Um, there was a production of a smell, like I said before, the sort of metallic -y smell coming off, and uh, the effervescence as well, the, the bubbles that came up, um, and they were all produced due to the reaction that was taking place. Okay, So remember that our end goal is to get our crystals. So my next step is I've tried to get um, as much of the copper oxide to react with the acid as possible, but... Um, some of it will have not reacted. Some of it will be still sitting there in solid form, and that is really going to hamper making my crystals because I want a solution. I want an ionic solution that I can evaporate the water away from in order to make some crystals. So I don't want any solid stuff left over. So what am I doing next? Well, if I want to get rid of something solid, I'm going to need to filter. So I'm going to take my conical flask and my funnel. I'm just going to pop the boiling tube in the rack for now. And I'm going to take some filter paper as well. I'm going to fold it over into my half moon shape and then fold it again. And then I've got nice little hoops. Nice little cone that I can put in my funnel. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour in my my ionic solution. What I should have here is I should have copper sulfate because the copper and the copper oxide has hopefully displaced the hydrogen in the acid. So pouring in here, and we should get a slow drop of our ionic solution just here. And as you can see, if you weren't able to before, there is in fact a blue colour to this solution now. Copper sulphate and we put some water in there as well. So I'm going to leave that for a little bit now and when it's filtered through we'll move on to the next bit. Alrighty, so here is my filtered copper sulfate solution.
we started with some copper oxide and some sulfuric acid, but the copper oxide has neutralized that acid and in its place we now have a salt in aqueous form. It's been dissolved in water. Um, you can see on the top here we've got the remnants of some solids copper oxide that because we had a little bit too much to react with the acid. If we had a little bit more acid we could have um, reacted this solid here but I, w I wanted to make sure that we didn't have any acid left and um, so I used uh, too much copper oxide so that I made sure that I neutralized all the acid. Okay so that's what we've got here. Now so we've removed the extra solid material here in order to get a nice uh, filtrate but we're looking to get crystals. So we're going to have to get rid of all of the water that's here because in this solution here is copper sulfate but there's also water as well. That's what makes it a solution. So we're going to need to evaporate that water off. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to take my evaporating dish. I'm going to take my ionic solution and pop it into there. And what you would usually do and what I would usually do is we would then pop it over a, um, a, a Bunsen burner set up like this. In fact, with because we are using a copper sulfate, we would actually do this. I wonder if anybody knows why we would do this. Now, there's no gas in school at the moment, so I can't use the Bunsen burner, but we would set the Bunsen burner off, change it to a blue flame. We would heat up this water, which would then heat up the solution here. Now, the reason we do that is because a naked flame directly onto this solution here is very likely to spit, and the spitting is quite dangerous. So what we use the water for is, it's called a heat sink, and it acts as a material that um, holds on to heat that's given by the Bunsen burner, and then it lets it out at a constant and slower rate into the, uh, into the ionic solution. And what that does is it means that the solution as a result will not spit. Now like I said, we don't have gas turned on in school at the moment, so I'm using a hot plate instead. Very similar to what you might um, have in your house, although obviously it won't look scientific like um, this one. Um, but it's the same principle. You've got a little dial here that you turn up and down, and what it does is it uh, heats up the surface here. So this white surface here is very hot at the moment. And you can see it's hot because it's starting to boil the water. And what that's doing is it is a safe and um, reliable way of passing heat from this uh, bit of technology, this, this machine, um, to the ionic solution, the copper sulfate solution, without um, making it spit. And I can already see that it's starting to evaporate. I can see the steam rising from it. I'm not sure if you can catch that on this camera, but I can certainly see how the solution has retreated from where it once was, and those are the start of crystals. Those are the first little crystals that we can see there. So you joined us back at the copper sulfate solution having evaporated by quite a great deal. You can see a r this rim that is formed around the evaporating basin and those are crystals of copper sulfate. So I'm going to take the remainder here and I'm going to pour it into our crystallizing dish. And I'm going to come back to it in 24 hours or so and hopefully I'm going to see nice big crystals because what I've got here is a very concentrated um, I've got very concentrated copper sulfate. I've evaporated a lot of the water off due to the amount of heat that it was given and now hopefully I've got a very concentrated solution of 
copper sulfate. That means that there'll only need to be a little bit of evaporation before all that we've got left is copper sulfate. So I'm hoping for really big crystals. After 24 hours, I've got a wonderful result here. Here is our copper sulfate crystals. Lovely, massive crystals. Because we did such a good job of evaporating off the water before we left them to finish off evaporating on the windowsill, that we got these lovely, lovely big crystals. So these are copper sulfate crystals. So here's a little whiteboard so far. We've got our mass of copper oxide and we've so far just got the mass of our crystallizing dish. So I'm going to pop on just here and take our mass. Okay, there's my pen. We've got a mass of 50.2. Grams. So that is the mass of the crystallizing dish and the copper sulfate crystals. So if I want to find just the copper sulfate crystals, well, I'm going to have to find the difference between the two together and the dish on its own. So I'm going to take uh, crystals and dish minus just the dish. And what we get is. Five, no, 4.5 4 grams. Yeah, that's right. 